have Chris and Paris just put this one together. And uh, the, the, I'm teaching this right now in a class at church. And the thing that I felt real bad about, I, I wish I had brought this for you, but this is this manual is designed. We do we do marriage retreats. We've done 27 marriage retreats over the years at our church. I've been in this church for 35, 36 years. And uh, so uh, not only do we produce a notebook like this for our couples retreat, I also wrote a manual for them for the retreat. The thing about this, uh, it, it, it's one of those things that kind of has to be explained in a class setting. So I, I didn't bring them, I wish I had, because you could have figured it out, whatever. Uh, and uh, I can feel bad about that, because that could have been an extra tool in your hand. But I want to begin by just reading something here and from Scripture, and then I'm going to give us an illustration, and then we're going to talk about this tool that's in your hand. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, I paraphrase that to read like this. Therefore, every spouse who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise spouse who built their marriage on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against their marriage. Yet it did not fall because it had its marriage on the rock. But every marriage who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish spouse who built their marriage on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against their marriage, and it fell with a great crash. Now, uh, one of the themes I want you to think about this morning is this simple, simple, simple theme is that you cannot take Christ out of there. And uh, I think so many times we try to work uh, our marriage when we really should be working our Christian walk. When we work our Christian walk and work on that, that's what helps influence the Christian marriage. And sometimes I think we get it backwards, to be honest with you. I really do. I think we tend to get it backwards. So we've got to find a way that we can work our marriage from the idea of a Christ-centered view of God's Word. So let me set the stage for you. Then we're going to do this illustration. Let me set the stage for you. I do a lot of counseling, and I have a couple that I've been working with for over a year, and it looks like the marriage has done a divorce. First of all, that doesn't sound like we're very successful at what we do. We spend a year with somebody, and it's walking out the door. It won't be the first time it's happened, and it may not be the last time. Now, if I show you the percentages of those who stay together, it's up here. But you're going to have those that do this, that are not going to make it. And you know what's at the root of it? They, they come to church, they will sing, they'll cry. This couple, they'll cry, they'll, they'll be reached out to the Lord. When they walk out the church door, they leave everything behind. It's like, what about the word did we not know was supposed to go with us that day? And it's amazing how the one party in this marriage, uh, they're doing, they're, they're not doing one thing spiritual or biblical, and they're Christians. They admit, he, they, they both admit they're Christians. It's him. He admits he's a Christian. He got saved in our church, and uh, and that was a, I think, a re-salvation. I think he got saved when he was younger. So he was raised in a Christian home. He knew all this, but then. He, he, he doesn't do anything spiritually in his marriage. It's like anything about church and the Word of God just doesn't matter. It's I can't work with her. I can't talk with her. It all goes back to that. Yet the Bible is filled with principles. In fact, I talk to people in our church all the time. The greatest tool that we have, the greatest book ever written on marriage is the Bible. I'm telling you, if I didn't have one book, and I read tons, if I didn't have anything, and all I had was the Bible, I could save a marriage. I could save my marriage. You could save your marriage. The Bible is capable of doing it. The problem is we don't read the Bible with marriage in mind. We read it with Christianity in mind. We don't read it with marriage in mind or family in mind. But it's there. It's packed in there. So I, I, I go to marry this couple. They're in their 30s. He was raised in the Assembly God Church, involved in his church up in Wilmington. This young lady in our church, she was new to the Assemblies, was raised from more Presbyterian, Episcopal type. But she was a believer, and she was at our church for several years, loved the Lord. 
and they met each other at a singles conference in uh, Maryland somewhere, Sandy, Sandy Cove. And so I'm counseling with them because we have a program. You can't get married in church unless you go through a counseling program. So we have various things that we use, and we use prepared and rich, basically it's an organization. But we do our own training too, with tons of stuff. And so here we are. He said in our sessions, I gave everything I could look, at. everything I could think of, I gave him to look at. Videos back in the day, videos, anything, DVD, anything we had, we would let him look at. I spent six months with him. I don't think we missed one or two weeks in six months of counseling. And um, he brought a list to his class one day, to our session one day. He says, Pastor, on here is. 36 things I wrote out that I want in a moment. And I'm happy to say today to you in front of my fiance, she has met all 36. Well, wow, you would just think, what else did we need to do? Let's get married, right? Well, we get close to the marriage and she, she wants to go through it. He gets a little bit antsy about it and he's wanting to put it off. Well, you know, this young lady had everything rolling. The invitations were out, everything's ready to go. It's like, now, in hindsight, she probably shouldn't have extended that. She did. She said, we're going to get married. We're not going to get married at all. I've got this thing planned out. Now, they did not know quite each other quite a year. And we teach at our church four seasons dating. Know how persons act in four seasons because they are different people in different seasons of the year. And they're very different when it gets to Christmas time. And in this particular instance, uh, I had a couple that they couldn't decide for the first marriage of pre marital council program, they couldn't decide where they must spend Christmas. I listened to them argument back and forth in the first session. So I said, can I just ask you a question? As they're going at it, uh, where do your families live? Well, they all live in Dover. Okay, that, this really should be a no-brainer. I said, did you think about spending Christmas Eve there and Christmas there, the first year of flipping it, or both, a little bit of each home? And you follow it. Well, they didn't think they needed pre marital council uh, I think they came back one other time. And then they never came back. So I saw them months later in the grocery store and said, hey, you never came back. Ah, we broke up. Now this is a couple that didn't need any counseling. But they broke up basically over one session because they didn't decide where to spend Christmas. All right? Now, to finish this other story, so they get married, this other couple I told you about, Christians, love each other, totally sold out to God, sold out to 36 things, she's met everyone. They didn't have sex the first night. She called me on the phone and said, Pastor, we didn't even have sex the first night. I said, and so we were, I was really upset. The youth pastor from the women's church came down and threw rice in my bedroom and all my drawers and my private stuff and everything. I was upset. And I just didn't feel like it. Said, okay. And so we did have sex the second night. And my husband says, the man that was raised in church all the Christian, 36 things said she met everyone said, I don't care to have sex with you again. And she says, Pastor, I don't know what to do. Well, in the interest of time, because I gotta show you this, they end up in divorce. He divorced her. Wasn't married a year and went to court and took part of her own, own earnings. All the stuff in the house and everything, that part of the court awarded him stuff. Now we went from two Christians that loved the Lord that spent we spent hours coming prepared. What happened? My brother-in-law married his wife and my wife was sister side. And after they had they had a wonderful honeymoon, and when they came back to have the first night together in the house, she said, I don't care to have sex with you anymore. Now they did. They had three children. But they didn't make it. Now, these are all believers. And my question is, what is missing in this equation? In fact, what is missing in most of the equations I'm dealing with? People leave Christ out of the marriage. And when you leave Christ out, you've just left out the Word. So they're not turning to the Word and activating the Word to be... You see, we want the Word to work for us, but my philosophy is if you don't work the Word, then the Word won't work. But when you work the Word, then the Word will work. The Word will work for you. There's a ton for The Word... We want the Word to work for us, but until we work the Word, the Word won't work for us. We have to activate this Word. It's, we call it in counseling, intentional choices versus choice dysfunction, choice, you know, dysfunction. So I need some, I need, uh, 
an illustration here today. I need, I need three guys to come up here. I hate the guy, but one of you guys have to be a home. So who, which one of you guys is well, to play? Come on, come on up here. All right. I need another guy up here. Married guy, preferably. All right. Yeah, I'll keep you over here. Stand. All right. All right. You hold that candle the candle. All right. The red one. I need someone to play Jesus. Watch every hand go up. Somebody to play Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on up here. Me? Yeah, come on up play Jesus. I make three hands. Well, none of us. None of us you just would. change your name. You're Jesus from now on. <laughs> now, one you, of, you're the tallest of the three. What I want to show you is this. Uh, have you ever seen the candlelight ceremony? Yes. Okay. In the candlelight ceremony. We're not going to invite you In the candlelight ceremony, what happens is, is, as you notice the air blowing through the room right now, I guarantee you these flames are not synced. They're going different directions. They're not synced together. Because they're two individuals. They're two individual lights. And so at the ceremony, we always stress when they get married that the, the idea is you want to become one in Christ. So we're going to have different views, different goals, all things. But now we're choosing to blend those together. In who? Christ. See, this is a covenant before God. That the two shall become one. It truly really is a mystery, as the Bible says. Now, we're going to do something first differently. These are both Christians. So, this is Christ. So, we're not going to like this yet, but I want you to stand in front of Christ right now, this way, face the problem. What you are now is now you are one in Christ. Now you're one in Christ because you accept Christ as your Savior. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I want you to stand in front of Him. Now, you have become one in Christ. So, I want you to envision that this is all one, one in Christ what you see in front of you. Now, when I'm with Christ, and Christ is in me, then I become responsible, as we said, I become responsible for the believerhood responsibilities. Now, let's come back over here as a spouse, back over there as a spouse. Now, at the candlelight ceremony, we have this, the spouses light this in our candle. So both, both of you light that candle at the same time. And let it get good and bright. Okay. Now, I want you to extinguish uh, yours and extinguish yours. Okay. Now, what we have here is we have two have become one in Christ. So both are in who? Christ. One light. Now watch this. When I wave the winds of adversity that we just read about, storms, rains, flood light, do you see the light separating? Or does it stay remain the one? But you know there's two lights there. You know there's two lights. There was not one light that made that light. But it doesn't separate. So try to imagine the way you would treat your spouse is exactly the way you're treating yourself. We might like the feeling that we are one up because we want this or want that. But all we've done is really hurt ourselves. When we hurt our spouse, we only hurt ourselves because we're one. Now, watch this. Uh, basically speaking, as a believer, am I going to go out tomorrow and just do as I please anytime I want, how I want? I'm not going to do that because I'm one with Christ. I know that that would please the Lord. You get where I'm going, don't you? Mm -hmm. Then why would we do that with our spouse if we're one with our spouse who's in Christ? The greatest gift I can give my wife in marriage is to give her over to the Lord, let God do what He wants to do in and through her at all times. And then I get the leftovers. That's not bad stuff. The best thing my wife can do is give me over to the Lord, let God do with me as He wants and pleases at all times, and then she gets the leftovers. That's not a bad deal. Because you know God's going to deliver to each other this powerful relationship that's being developed. But the key here is we're all one in Christ. Never again when those lights are separated, that's one person decides to walk away. And then they take their own individuality back. Not that you've lost it, but then they take back their own rights and they walk away with their own rights, with their own light again. But they pull away from the spouse. And, biblically speaking, if it's not a biblical, proper separation or divorce, they've also walked away in disobedience. Is that, is that, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Jill, for that. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. that very much. So if I could, if, if I could draw your attention to this manual, i got to see what time this, okay, you see that, that time. What I want to do is I want to make sure that, uh, we all know what happened in the garden. Yes. By all means. Thank you, I apologize. 
what I put together was, and, and we're going to go page by page because I want to be able to take time to explain this. So if you look at this quote, learn to take change, we'll look like this for your second page. Learn to take change, to make change your friend and take it by the hand before it takes you by the throat. And then the next statement I put together was, that was not my quote. I don't know who it was, so I have a quote mark. I do everything quoted out. Who's, who's me on PC and who's not, so I don't take credit for what is in mind. I like to give credit where it's due. We do not stick with what God is doing. We short live the process of what God is changing in us because we because we see change as uncomfortable and or the addition of wrong. Yes? Can I share something that has to do with this? I've been mean, like 52 years. Yes, please. And I hope that God speaks to, to those of you that are married. Uh, I became a born again Christian because of my wife prayed. I was not a born again Christian when I married her. She was. Well, when I became a born again Christian, I became a Pharisee. And I became super spiritual. And I was always asking the Lord to change my wife. Because she wasn't meeting my expectations. And I prayed. Earnestly for about, I say, four or five years. And one day alone in the house, the Holy Spirit, very just like you're speaking to me today, came and, and I was praying, said, Lord, change my wife. And then he said, Go sit at the table and grab a piece of paper and a pen. And I did. And it was so, such a beautiful experience. So I learned later on. And I sat at the table and I said to me, write all the bad things that you find in her. And I go, oh, well, I was in heaven. <laughs> and here I go. I got to five. I couldn't find no more. And he let me pause for a while. Then he said, go to the other side of the page and start writing all the good things that you find in her. And then all the good things go home and down to the bottom of the page. And this is a true experience. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, she doesn't need changing. You do. And it opened my eyes. And because of that experience, I started to see my wife the way God always wanted me to see her, as what she was to me uh, in the eyes of Christ, and not the way I was looking at her. And this year we'll be celebrating 53. Good exercise. But well, that experience, I mean, that experience really uh, changed, changed my view of marriage uh, tremendously. Yes, you know, very good. Thank you for that. And in the class I'm doing at Wisdom Ice right now, I four weeks ago I said, write down all the expectations that uh, you have about your spouse in marriage. So they did, and I had to read them out loud. And then the next week I said, now I'd like you to write down, I give a worksheet, write down all the expectations that you have of yourself in the relationship. I said, this time put it in a sentence form, not just a bunch of words. And they did. And it was very eye-opening. But they had to be them to come up with the expectations. By the way, the list went as long as the other one, first Peter. The third week I had him write down, how well do you know your spouse? I had 15 things. How well do you know your spouse? Well, a lot of them did very well. Well, this past Wednesday night I had him write down, how well do you know your wife spiritually, your spouse spiritually? And I wrote down 10 things to look for. Of all the four exercises, they failed in that miserably compared to the other three. So I, I that's right. So I asked him, I said, I said, you know what this shows, don't you? It shows a few things. Number one, you may not be as spiritual in your life as you may think you are. Number two, it means you're not communicating spiritually in your marriage. Because you don't know enough about each other in your marriage. Which says that neither one of you are in hot pursuit necessarily of your spiritual part of your life. Now I said that lovingly. <coughs> and they took it very well. Because it's an it's an it's a it's they, they opened the door for them. That's what this and this is the book we're using. This this is what this means. When a husband and wife are pursuing God at the same time, their communication is on the same level. Now, if they're if one's the servant goo one does not, then it's like this, we're going to be off. Now, does it doesn't mean that couples have problems. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, this manual helps to show that idea. So let's let's just go ahead and walk through this. Uh, 
there's some scripture there in Genesis 2. We're not going to take time to read that. There's some scripture from Ephesians chapter 5, which we won't take time to read that. There's scripture for 1 Peter 3. We're not going to take time to read that. But let me tell you, the per one thing you do want to read for sure uh, is... Uh, hopefully it's in here. I thought I saw it somewhere. Uh, hmm. Did you, what did you have inside your cover, the very first page? Did you have a quote? By a chance from somebody? Yeah, Thornton Wilder. Thornton Wilder. Yeah, this man who doesn't have that. Does everybody have that quote? Yeah, it was that Thomas. Is he used to Thornton Wilder? Yeah, but there's that. But there's a, maybe it's near the bad. Is Dora the quote there? What do you have? What's that say? It says, I didn't know. Yeah, read that out loud. I don't, some of you don't have that, do you? That's not good. Yeah. You don't have it. Alright, who doesn't have it? Here's one of the guys. A switch. Don't worry if you're open. Don't worry. Oh, if you need a copy of something, you're open. No, no, no. Alright. Anybody else not have it? I so apologize. You might have not have it? Yep, I'll switch it. I want you to make sure you have that. Yeah, yeah, we'll switch it out. That's important. Hey guys, watch your head. That you know what happened? We already had some done. It almost fell off the wall. And then my secretary uh, made up some more new ones. So, all right, here's two that has it. Somebody else need it? All right, let's we'll switch out. Thank you, sir. Well, we're bad. Not only did we not give you one, we didn't you sit there and give them the wrong one. All right, so go ahead and read that out a lot. I didn't marry you because you were perfect. I didn't marry you because I loved you. I married you because you gave me a promise. That promise made up for your faults. And the promise I gave you made up for mine. Two imperfect people got married. And it was the promise that made the marriage. And when our children were growing up, it wasn't a house that protected them. It wasn't our love that protected yeah, that was that promise. Yeah, beautiful. You can you can uh, look at that and, and read into that. that it, and he's not saying it's not the other things. He's just saying that. But I made a promise for God, so I have to make this work. How do you make it work? You got to keep Christ in the marriage. So we try to work the marriage. We should be working Christianity so we can work our marriage. We can get it back. So go to page one. And what this is is I put together thirteen potential problems in the marriage. There could be more, but I've listed a potential of 13 problems. So we should, uh, page one should be when communication issues are there. Is that what your picture is? Mm -hmm. So we got that right in this paper. Very good. I tell you, I drive my sister crazy. She's produced these things for years. But there's a lot of work to produce these things. Many, many hours to put it. First of all, all has to be, I have to write it all, then she has to try to read my writing, bless her heart. So here we go. I need help with the following areas of my marriage. When the following, you don't have. I don't I can't Did we mess up again in that book? Okay. Good. Now when I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is probably not read all thirteen because of the interest of time. But uh, what I will do is I'm going to highlight some of the illustrations of it because what I failed to do when I did this and when I do these again, I'm going to see, go to the back of an illustration and write out what it means so that if people look at an illustration later, they know what that means, they can just look at the back. That's not done yet on this particular manual, so we'll get that together. But when communication issues are present, now I, I give a little what I call a snippet. What does that look like? So here it is. Communication issues persist. When in our relationship, we cannot get any deeper than surface conversation. This happens when our conversation never investigates the question, how are you doing? Conversation needs to go below the surface so two people can share how they are feeling without any fears or perceived backlash. There is one, surface communication, two, emotional communication, and then what we call weeping communication, to where two people can cry if need be, share their deepest thoughts, of all their secrets, speak in the truth of love, and even pray together. If these simple principles cannot be followed, 
than, than more skill in communication is necessary. Now, let me first explain how this manual works. So, once a month, we, and we've given out many of these as the pastors of the district, we've given them out to um, church people galore. We have a large congregation, so a lot of people like this. And what it is, they're going to take this out once a month. And they're going to look over the 13 questions, 13 concerns. Rate your current condition, use pencil. So if after you read number one with your spouse sitting down one evening and you're doing good, you just check your bid box and you keep moving. If it's not too bad, you can keep moving. If it's not good or terrible, then we give some help. So you go to the next page. And uh, uh, David Powell came out in his book, by uh, My Afraid to Love, gives five levels of communication. I, on the right side, have simplified it into three things. I've been using these three things for years. Uh, I just combined some things that David Powell's book did. He said, sharing your mere cliches, typical day stuff. So you, you can begin to see uh, the differences in the levels as you fall down with it. And one and two, I put down service communication. Any couple can do this. In the second bracket, reveal opinions, truthful thoughts expressed, share most and sadness, or is what we call emotional communication. Is where you, you kind of get below the surface, and, and that's when the real feelings start to come out. Then you have to be transparent, going from being an argumentative, possibly to sharing your deepest thoughts emotionally, or what we call weeping, sewing into and adding all these up, we sew into the relationship. Uh, this is not easy for some men to do. It's hard for them to get that emotional. They, they, they have a rougher exterior. And, and usually a rough exterior is indicative of a rough interior. So now we've opened the whole world of counseling to where, listen, you, you, you want to bless your wife during the week? They get as deep into the conversation you can with her. Because that will bless her heart immensely. That she sees your vulnerable Hearts. She sees your openness, your true feelings. Even if you're not comfortable with what she's going to, she may not be coming what you hear. She wants to hear that. Believe me, your wife wants to hear this. Down below, my secretary put this picture in. I said, I said Renee, you're going to get me in trouble. Look at that guy. He looks wicked. And she said, oh, well, that's how men are sometimes. So I let it stay. So I said, wait, not her, my sister. But you've heard what defensive thinking is, right? Defensive thinking is you were thinking of what you're going to say while your spouse is talking. So you really haven't heard a thing she said because you're busy preparing your statement. Whereas on the active listening side, you not only listened well to what your spouse said, but because my wife and I do this, we do this at our team meetings. You, you, you kidding me? Have you ever sat in a room with 10 team members at a meeting on a Tuesday, like at our place? We're all talking at one time. We, we all interrupted each other. Not all the time, but you get my drift. And so there's things that we miss because we're all talking, we're all excited about talking about things. Well, the same thing happens between the relationship. If you can give your spouse that undivided attention while she's talking, you will hear what she's saying better. And that will help her to know what you're feeling about. She does the same thing. Now, let's move on to this chart. Uh, I just had this chart out was night in my class. I put this chart together to show what we call performing under peak pressure. Have you ever had it at times in that relationship with family, kids, whatever, that there's this intense level of pressure going in the home. It's just like nobody can say anything without singing their words. Are you coming to dinner? Dinner's ready. Hello. Everybody sings. That's why so many people sing party because everybody sings in their home all the time. They always sing their uh, tension instead of just speaking their tension. And uh, so anyways, this model says that these, these are words that we are that we're attacking each other with. Now this isn't bad. It's, you can communicate. But this is conflict. A conflict class. Disagreement. You only have so much time, gentlemen, if we can out, jump out the window of opportunity. Because after a while, those words start cutting deep into our spirit. They get so close, if we don't stop, if we don't, one of us doesn't stop, you see the tension level grows, we are going to be cutting deep into our spirit. And when I mentioned this to the class this night, I could hear the overtones around the tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible to look at each other. And this is what we call by a little bit of heat pressure. It's like there's so much tension in the air. Do you know why there's tension? Well, I gotta talk fast. Do you know why there's tension in the air? Because you work thousands of square feet away from your spouse during the day. Then you come home the other day and you reduce your thousand square feet to about 20, 
2,400 square feet. Well, you get it to the living room at night to watch TV, you reduce your, your uh, square footage down to uh, three, 400 square feet. Then you get into your bed at night and you reduce it down to what, 30, 40 square feet. The tension, the closer you get at the end of the day, when there's pressure between you, the greater the tension is in the closer spaces. So the safest place on earth should be the bedroom. The bed in the bedroom should be the safest place on earth. It should be the bed in the bedroom. The bed should be the safest place on earth for your spouse. And that's the place where most tension is built because now you have to lay beside each other at night. So the, the, the footage has shrunk, so the tension has increased. All right, that's what this console is about. Somebody has to stop it to come out of your when a, when a person does not cry, their tears drip into their soul. Therefore, cry. Cry. Because if those tears are going to shut side. Now, we, we have another question. When finances are a constant strain between two people, any couple, any time can have financial challenges, but when it is constant, and it's a constant source of pain, disagreement, anger, feelings, distrust, secrecy of spending, and constant skill may be needed. It is becoming more prevalent for couples to divide their money into two accounts. This has proven in some cases to be a certain amount of free spending without accountability. This sometimes breeds secretive liberties when one can spend as much as he or she wants without communicating to the other. Boy, do I know I deal with this in the office all the time. This causes unanswered questions to the other spouse as to where the money is gone. This does duty really breeds suspicion. Should this be happening without full agreement between spouses? Counseling may be necessary. By the way, here's our point. If you can't follow these suggestions that we gave you, then you do have to call somebody out. Never make sure you understand that. You do have to call somebody to help you. If, if these charts are to help you resolve it to prevent marriage counseling. Because you can work on it yourself if you follow these simple rules. Yes? Uh, one thing that was revealed to me is that a financial responsibility to a wife doesn't end uh, when they put us in the grave. Uh, that as Christian husband, we should have a financial plan that will provide for our wife when we are gone. That she doesn't have to suffer. That's right. Uh, so it is a responsibility that we have as men to leave enough for them to to, to live comfortable. That's right. But, and not be in, in, in need or, or depending on children and relatives yeah. to provide for her. Exactly right. Thank you. Uh, the next illustration, the finances there, chart three. Uh, these are 10 things you can work with with your finances. I, I really wish we had time to go over them, but these are just simple, 10 simple tips. I've written two manuals on uh, finances and uh, how to do budgets and stuff. And uh, so then there's a sample page you can use uh, that you can put, to, you put together that people can use to help with their finances. You can just look at some of those charts. I do want to let you know that. Uh, I brought some business cards, but my email is pastor at calvarydover.org if you want to jot that down. Pastor at calvarydover.org, all small case. Pastor at calvarydover.org. And I want you to please feel free to email me about any of these things because I know we won't have time to go to depths. Pastor at calvarydover.org. Now, here's one. When arguing disagree over sexual issues or uncomfortable sexual experiences, uh, this subject is used as there are are many facets to it. For instance, if there was sexual, I'm on page three, if there was sexual abuse in your younger years, this can and most likely will come back if you have problems. As a wife, you may not like certain experiences of sex, thinking that they are wrong, but in actuality, it was your dad, your brother, relative, friend, or stranger who did it to you. This could have happened to you as a boy as well. Failing to see proper affection and love in the home growing up makes one deficient in how to express and receive proper love and affection. I deal with that in constant all the time. Early experiences in pornography can help, can have a deep effect upon your marriage and spouse. How you view your spouse and expectations may be out of range of what is normal. Not having sex for long periods of time. I got a guy in church who's been married 13 years and had sex yet. She's dying for it. He won't do it. On being grown into a parallel disconnected relationship from one that was once connected, if you are at any time being distracted physically or in your mind, help is needed. Sometimes this happens when the opposite sex shares their marriage problems with you. The basic rule of thumb, if you are not a marriage counselor, then do not try to counsel refer. Remember, marriage is not a contract. It is a connection, a deep connection, silly by sexual expression. If any of these or other reasons 
uh, such as estrogen, testosterone, we have to that this morning. Levels may be up, our present skill may be needed. So once a month, go through, check this. What, what will your mind check? It's not good, but will you check? It's terrible. Then look at the charts uh, that we have provided here for you. Uh, there's one chart in particular, if this doesn't seem to help you, you by the way, if your sexual problems are that bad, you probably should go to counseling. If you, if you aren't able to get it fixed up, so. And, and it doesn't, you don't have to have hours of counseling. Sometimes you can do one or two sessions. I had a guy with a woman at one time, and he said, literally, literally put his hand on her shoulder, stood behind the chair, fat pastor, fix her. I'm tired of her not wanting sex. I'm tired of not wanting sex the way I want it. Fix her. And walked out of the room, out of the office. After my flesh knocked him out, Picked him up, set him out of the office, and hear what I said? My flesh. I did do that. But how rude to be to bring your wife and put your hand up, fix her. I want more sex, I'm not getting it. Fix her. Boy, that was rude. That was rude. So, anyways, so we're in our session, and we're talking, and she's got something in her past, she can't figure out what it is. So, we talked. That morning, next morning, except I get a phone call, she passed out, I woke up throwing up. Dead. So what happens? I had this horrible dream. And in my dream, I listen to this. My grandfather is standing over me. He's performing oral sex. He's chasing me around the bedroom. He's doing sexual things to me. Now listen to this. She's in her 40s. This was in her 20s and she got in my She had repressed it so deeply. Suppressed it in so deeply. Repressed means, you can't remember. Suppressed means it's deep unless you remember. But hers was so deep. How do you not remember at age 23 your grandfather is doing things to you sexually and stand over you and laughing? How do you not remember at 23? That's how devastating it was because she had years of experience. So she, she, uh, I said, well, praise the Lord. She said, what? I said, sister, don't you see what happened? I said, God gave you a dream. This is the only story I can tell you about women who have dreams after they've had a session with me. God, because they start talking about it, spit it out. And I said, God just told you what happened. This is why you're, you're settling down on your husband. And I uh, said, what am I going to do tonight if I go to bed and I haven't done that? I said, just go to bed and read the Psalms. She did. She never had any more bad dreams because she had to release that day. And I can tell you story after story of women who been my office had dreams. Just in one session, God gives them a dream that night. They just needed to talk about it. So if you have or your spouse has had sexual abuse, there might be a session needed for help in that case. Three rules about sex. Don't force it. Nothing gets the other person's will. And do not induce pain to create pleasure. By that no force it, we mean don't make your wife go to bed and give you sex when she doesn't feel like it. Whereas nothing gets the other's will. Some women don't like certain acts of sex because that's the very act that somebody else did to them when they were younger. So you've got to get them, let them get healed, then show them how what that person did to you really is normal. But it was abnormal at the time of your life, but it's normal in a marital setting. So you, you've got to be able to teach that person. It's not easy telling a woman in the office, it, it really is okay to give your husband certain things that he wants. They're not looking at wrong. I had a lady come to me, she said, I've been to a psychiatrist, I've been to a sociologist, I've been to a psychologist, psychiatrist, and a hypnosis, a hypnotic person. All four have said that what my husband wants to do is not wrong. You are a pastor, you're the last resource I have. If you say it's not wrong, I stop coming. I'm done. I'm done with the marriage, and I'm done with this. So she told me three things her husband didn't like. I already knew in my spirit they were not wrong. But I allowed her to go home, take a week. She came back a week later. She said, walked in, sit down. She said, okay, here I am. So tell me, are they wrong? I said, well, I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear, but they're not going to be wrong. So I waited for the exit. She didn't exit. Did I tell you about a dream I had last night? I said, sure, did. In my dream, I'm arguing at the board, and my dad, grandfather walks up to me. He starts doing sexual things to me. And she began to say all these things that he did to her. Guess how many there were? Three. Guess what three things she didn't want her husband to do? Those three things. She says, and you were in my dream, Pastor. I says, okay. 
She said, well, you remind me of not what took you. And I asked you a question. I said, Pastor, is this why I the way I ended with my dad because of what my grandfather did? And she said, you said in the dream, that is why. I was in her dream. And I said to her that day, I said, well, sister, that is right. God gave you a victory. She broke and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. If I'm not mistaken, I think I had to put the trash can beside the chair. I'm not sure, but she sobbed and sobbed. Had a huge breakthrough. Saw her months later. She says, Pastor, 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 I got to tell you some good news. What? She says this to me in the hallways of the church. People walking around. Pastor, guess what? My husband and I are doing all three things. I got the Praise the Lord. And she did go on to get other counseling with our counselor on staff. And she came to me for that part and finished up counseling and other things with the other counselor. Uh, so uh, then we have next page four, where there's constant argument. Uh, there's, you check yourself once again, see how you're doing. Uh, the resolution conflict, this is J.E. Adams. So many times, uh, uh, we, we, on chart five, we, we attack each other, don't we, at the top level. Where we should be attacking what? The second level, the issue. How do you attack the issue? Well, you... Uh, uh, should look like this, brother. And you just you just passed it. Brother, you just passed it through this. Next page, here you go. So what you should do is when when your when your wife is talking, put yourself in her shoes. This is JD Adams' model. Put yourself in her shoes so that when she's talking to you, you you hear your you hear her talking in a way that how it's affecting her, because you put yourself in her shoes with her feelings. She's to put herself into your shoes so when you're talking, she's actually pretending she's you. So she can feel what you're feeling. Here's how my wife does it. If you are a husband and wife and you're not getting along well, she actually has you get up and switch seats in the session. And he says, she'll say to the man, now you're sitting in your wife's seat, so I want you to play the role of your wife. I want you to hear what your wife says to you as if it's you. Boy, does it work well. So his model works good. If you will put yourself in your spouse's shoes, it's not only will you hear, but you begin to feel. Let me tell you something else with this. Body language. we got to look at body language. When you look at body language, and you feel what they're feeling. Let me tell you something about children. Let me tell you something. Don't be fooled when they're running around the house smiling, thinking everything's okay. Watch their mood. Watch their body language. Listen well. Your kids are watching you like a hawk. Uh, this is from preparing to originally give you a conflict resolution. Ten things you can do to prepare to meet together and discuss an issue. It's very intense. It's very overboard. But they provide this so if two people just cannot get it resolved in a normal argument, then have a, what's called a conflict resolution chart and do all ten things and then get together and get it resolved. You can fix your problems without going to a counselor. Right? Is there a lack of spiritual unity present? Let's just take a look at the chart. This is this is not my chart. I've doctored it up, but this came from another counselor. I know we were staying, so I couldn't give him credit, but I want to give him credit. Our tendency is we try to bring our relationship together on a physical level. See the bottom chart? We try to bring our relationship on a physical level together. And it, it doesn't work well that way. By the way, prior to marriage, a lot of that happens, right? What you do is, at the top chart, right, when you bring yourself together spiritually, see that red sir, that red um, spot? When you come together spiritually, it helps bring you together emotionally, which helps bring you together physically. Do you know when I do bring on a counseling, I've already lost it. I, most of those couples just sit there buying time because we won't marry them unless they go through the program. I can tell they're just sitting there. You can just tell they want to get through it so they go out and do their thing. Many of them have had sex outside of marriage. So you can't reason with them because they've already crossed that line. And it's so powerful, so strong to them, they can't imagine life without them. But then, then they get married, and then they end up back in my office or Jody's office or somebody else's office getting help to save the marriage because they didn't work on the marriage because they weren't paying attention to us because they were busy being too physical together or living together. We, My wife uh, was responsible to have two doctors come to the board and uh, chiropractors. And they were living together. And I was, she did the discipleship for months to know them in the Lord, and both got saved. But they were living together, and they get married. And uh, so I did the premarital counseling, and I said to them, I said, Pete, Julie, the first thing you got to do is stop having sex. 
First thing, thank you. First thing you gotta do is stop having sex. All right, it's first thing you gotta do. All right, let's move on. I, I feel bad because we're not gonna have time to finish all this, but if you let me take you back to some of these are self-explanatory. Read the questions. Do, do this once a month together. You will help yourself. Let me get back. There's one. All right. All right. I want you to go to go back to page. We got to talk about this. Page ten. Go back to go to page ten and go to the chart. Chart eight. It's called the Murphy of Adultery. We have to talk about this before we close out. And the rest of the manual has got a lot of good stuff in the back. Marriage resource. Everything that you see is a marriage resource. I have read. These are good books you can look up. I've read all these books. And, uh, and there's just some other good helps in the back. Helps in the back. I, 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 I could do a whole day just teaching you this kind of and, uh, But did you find this chart? All right. There's, I, years ago, I was really concerned about all the affairs, which there is no such thing as affair. Did you know that? There's no such thing as the Bible as an affair. It's called adultery. That's what it is. It's adultery. <laughs> and we get away from that word adultery because it's a spooky <coughs> word, but uh, it's adultery. But we use the word affair. And we call it the burden of adultery. Do you see the left side there? Safe communication. Verb. These are things that are safe to do when you're with another woman at work, whatever. The second column is, is what we call cautious communication. How are you doing? Because if you look at our model before, when you start saying, how are you doing, you now start getting into the deeper level of a person's being. The surface stuff is gone. Well, you know, come to think about it, my marriage sucks. Really? I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on? Well, she shares that word. Then all he has to say is one thing. What do you think it is? Can you guess? If he's not a man of God who's careful, what do you think he says? Something like this. Ah, I know what you mean. We've kind of got the same issues, just a little bit different. We're constantly. Let's talk sometime. I'm telling you guys, I've done thousands of hours of counseling, hundreds of couples. What I just told you, I hear it all the time. That workplace, that internet, is a killer. If we're not careful. So we have what's cost of the line. Dangerous communication, verbal affair, emotional about. By the way, I need to change this because there's another affair that happens. There's two more affairs that happen. Uh, well, no, there's one more affair that happens before you have your verbal affair and emotional about. You know what it is? Thought affair. That's where we use the word affair. <laughs> okay? Thought. We, could, we start committing thoughts in the mind, adultery in the mind, which later becomes words which later becomes emotionally involved. And then you start seeing all the things that happen. Then you get to the physical touching. You know, um, cross lunch was nice talking to you. Watch me. It was nice talking to you today. That's a signal. Did you know that? This is a signal. Really nice talking today. Squeezing on the hand, rubbing the thumb. That's a signal. When you said that, I'm saying I care for you. Our body language sends more messages than you can imagine. So what happens in the physical touch, then you have the adultery, and see the tension line continues to grow and grow and grow. So what we have to recommend here is it, 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 this next chart I put together to show how we justify adultery. You see all these arrows coming at each other? You see all these arrows? That's disagreements you've had with your spouse over the years. Isn't it interesting? After 19 years of marriage, that someone else at the top left, someone else comes on the scene. And all of a sudden, they think they have justification for adultery. Well, we say, why don't you why don't you start down here at the bottom, Philip? Why don't you start here fixing your problems? Why don't you wait for years to go by to think, to think you had a justification to commit adultery? You follow? Then we have a, a trust model that we put together. How do we build trust after that? Well, I have to close because the boss walked by, but I have a, I have something for you to take home. At our couples retreats, we do this all the time. We've done this for years at our couples retreat. Uh, even if you're not married, you will be one day. What this is is a you take one of those. Ready? Right? You're 
you, you, if you're married, why don't you take your wife to a restaurant and have a candlelight dinner? <laughs> we do this all the time. We go when we have our retreats.